Moshi Moshi. Hello. I'm Zeb Ramsbotham. And I'm Annie Ramsbotham. And we're the Rambling Ramsbothams. Our journey might be rambling, but we hope this podcast isn't. And this podcast will be slightly rambling. Yes, we have lots rambling of... Rambling in topics, but short <laughs> in terms of length. <laughs> we thought it might be fun to do some news reports, and it's not news... It's nothing that will be useful. <laughs> it's all um, some random fun articles or things that we learned so it's the not so informative news report that might be useful <laughs> someone might be really looking for these topics well and the basically, first one. Oh. Oh. well i was just gonna say we're doing this a week early um and because annie's going on another trip next yes. week so next week will be maybe a more well so this one yeah the episode after this one could be more fun because we'll be talking about some stuff that Annie gets to see. Yeah, a little adventure. But first, yeah. some facts about some things in Japan. Such as, did you know that Japan has the most musical roads out of any country? I didn't know it had the most. Yeah. Because honestly, I didn't know any other country had musical roads. Well, that's roads. what I was going to say. Like, maybe we should talk about what a musical road is. Because I didn't know that a musical road... I had heard that... You could drive over these grooves in a road and it would play a sound, but that seemed like magic to me. <laughs> like, that didn't really seem like something that was real. Like, rumble strips that play sound, or that play a song. But there's 30 melody roads that are in Japan, uh, or musical roads, and they they go all up and down the country. And, like I said, it's the most out of any country, but actually in America, there's... One in California, and then there's one in New Mexico on Route 66. Hmm. I don't, I don't know if you knew about those. No, I didn't know about those. I mean, I like, kind of like you had heard about a musical road, but it's just not something that really I ever think about. And so, actually, when we drove across one here in Japan, I was kind of like very surprised. I know. I was going to talk about that one specifically when we were driving to Shima Onsen. That was the first road that. I had experienced this on and do you remember we actually like so we were driving in the dark and all of a sudden this like song started like vibrating through the car and we turned around and we drove back over it again because we were so like I don't know just surprised and happy yeah, about it because I don't remember if there was a sign and if there was a sign we either just like missed it or it wasn't in English um and maybe because it was dark we just missed it uh but yeah it just really caught me off guard so in Shima Onsen one of the bathhouses is really famous because of the red bridge inspired spirited away we talked about that previously that's what they say this yeah they claim that but <laughs> i didn't know that the song that we heard was actually from spirited away it's the always with me is the english hmm. title itsu nan demo itsumo nando demo is the ending theme for one of the songs in the spirited away movie that's interesting yeah because i thought that the song sounded familiar but I couldn't, like, place it. But I've seen Spirited Away, like, a million times. So that makes sense. That it sounded a little familiar. Yeah, first fun fact of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. What's your news slash fun fact? So this one's pretty quick. Um, and essentially, we got ripped off. Oh, um, <laughs> okay. So in Kanazawa, we were talking a lot about the Kanazawa Castle Light Show by Team Lab. Yeah. Um. It was very cool. It seemed groundbreaking. We were really excited about it. Thought it was this neat, unique event. Um, but maybe a listener heard that and was like, oh, I didn't know you guys lived in Fukuyama. <laughs> because um, Team Lab has actually done that exact same event for another castle. Oh. So they did it for Fukuyama's, I think it was 400th anniversary. It's a pretty impressive anniversary. Yeah, in December of 2022. Are and it had just, the same exact title. Are you just saying that it was we got ripped off because it was like a copy? Yeah, they just reused everything. Oh, I, I don't... thought that they had like crafted it for oh. us here in Kanazawa. That they like really thought deeply about Kanazawa Castle oh. and they were very inspired and they came here specifically to Kanazawa. I guess that makes sense. But in I... reality, they already had this whole like light show that they <laughs> had just like packed away somewhere. For any generic castle. Yeah, and they were like, "Well, yeah, we'll bring it over for Kanazawa, mm. whatever." They did change some things because like they had Maeda Toshie and stuff. But anyway, 
Yeah, I, don't feel... I guess that also explains why they they had another there were like a few other generals as they called them that were generic japan generals Are, they weren't just from toyama no oh. they weren't specific to ishikawa oh. um like i think one was like tokugawa yasu oh. who's Are you from sure? yeah i remember specifically hearing the name and being like but he's not from oh. i don't feel quite the intensity that you do because it was still new to me but... no i'm just joking i don't really care <laughs> <laughs> like I have no <laughs> no hard feelings <laughs> one way or the other. Oh. It was still cool to see. I just I did think it was funny because there was an article on the newspaper and it was about Kanazawa and then at the bottom of the article they were like you might be interested in and then it was this like the exact same light show. Yeah, it was like an article from 2022 and I like was like that looks familiar and then yeah. I clicked on it and it was the same thing. So well, yeah. Another fun thing that I learned uh, recently, is that Gunma, and specifically Kiryu, is very famous for making silk because the Akagi Mountains have such high quality silkworms. Did you I know about the silk making industry in Kiryu? I didn't. I got to tour a silk factory, which was actually really, I learned a lot, such as <laughs> just the sheer quantity of silkworm pods that you need for any amount of clothing. I mean, I guess that's why silk is so expensive. So that's not that surprising. But for example, just to make one kimono, like one uh, short sleeved kimono of, uh, you know, standard <laughs> of standard length, you need a thousand, uh, sorry, you need 3000 silkworm pods. And then if you want to make a furisake kimono, like where it has the long sleeves, you need 10,000 hmm. pods. And I, I don't know, that's a lot of little silkworms. Yeah, also it's kind of unfortunate because I'm pretty sure you like boil them. You do. So So you like kill the silkworm and then you do. snag the silk from it. Yeah. Which well, is a little sad. When you say it like that. However, but that's they what used, you do. Yeah. What do you mean when you say it like that? Well, but they they're not just wasted. So they used to eat the worms like people would. Hmm. And now the delicacy. Yeah, well there's in the factory they were saying that now we don't eat the worms because there's not really a demand for that but they do have like an in with the fishing industry so then they give them as bait hmm. um so they're still like, used but you know i'm gonna yeah. burst your silk bubble mm. so we're planning this up and coming bike trip for the end of november yeah and one of the areas i was looking at riding through had like the same kind of thing oh, they they're were like, like we're, we're the famous best. for our silk and they have like a silk museum and you can go see all this like silk stuff. Well, so far all I've heard is like how great the Gunma area and the Kiryu like town specifically are. Well, you so were there. Maybe we'll have an update, like well, breaking I'm, news. <laughs> I'm going to start calling Gunma my coworkers. Silk is trash. <laughs> when you guys think of silk, what do you think of? Yeah. This is slightly unrelated, okay. but kind of on topic. Just like everything on this episode. Similar thing. Yeah. So, and popularity in Japan. You know how everyone says that Kanazawa is famous for our seafood? Uh, yeah. I was talking to one of my coworkers, and she was like, oh, the people here in Ishikawa talk about Hokkaido is famous for its seafood. Oh, wow. Well. And so she was like, people come from around the country to eat kaisendan mm -hmm. in, like, Ishikawa, which mm -hmm. is like a seafood bowl. And she was like, oh, but Ishikawans loved going to Hokkaido to eat kaisendan. Uh, well, and I mean, the grass is always greener. I know. It's just like a funny, like... Yeah. Yeah, you're always shuffling around. I like guess maybe it's all people relative. like Kiryu are like, we should go to Shimane <laughs> Prefecture <laughs> to get their silk. Maybe. Yeah. It is all relative. We are like on a coast though, so of course we have better seafood than anything inland and it's cheaper than anything over by Tokyo, so Maybe. Can't compete with Hokkaido though. Yeah. So this is very related to seafood. Oh. Cuz it comes from the ocean. Okay. It's Godzilla. That's not at all related. Yeah, it is. He's a sea critter. He lives out there in the water. He eats fish, I'm sure. Godzilla, you qualify him as a sea critter? Yeah. He's like a lizard. But he lives in the water. Oh. <laughs> so, so this is, I guess, any listeners who have heard us talking about movies already know that I'm very bad at watching any movies, but I've actually never seen any Godzilla movies You've before. never seen a single godzilla movie no. not one not no. a single in his like 80 years of air like time a kid like princess movie genre was like the thing so i didn't really watch a lot of you know 
Godzilla type stuff. I'm shocked. I we haven't yeah. watched it yet. I said we were going to watch it tonight. I also learned yesterday Annie has never seen Tropic Thunder. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> has no idea what it is. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm really bad at watching movies. Yeah, I'm horrified. So anyway, but, you're bringing up Godzilla. Why? Because there's a new Godzilla movie in theaters. In Japan. And I kind of want to go see it because... One, it actually has a pretty good rating online right now. Hmm. And kind of like when we got to see a Miyazaki film, like, premiere in theaters, it would be fun also to see, like, a Godzilla film in theaters. Um, and this, maybe it's, maybe a lot of people know this, but if you ask a Japanese person about Godzilla, they'll look at you very confused, because in Japan, he is Gojira. He's oh. not Godzilla. Um, he has a different name. So don't ask a Japanese person about Godzilla because they'll have no idea <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I just think it's like pretty cool. And this one is supposed to be like harkening back to Godzilla's roots, kind of the original. His roots as a secreter? No, just like the original films because he's also <laughs> a commentary on, of course, like many things in Japan, a commentary on nuclear war. Mm. Um, so he was a secreter. And in some things, he was like a regular lizard, and then he got exposed to radiation. Some things, I think he was kind of like a fossilized, like, animal that got brought back to life due to radiation. Um, but most all the time, it's a nuclear disaster, brings back Godzilla, and then he rampages through Japan mm. and destroys the countryside, mostly Tokyo. Um, but this one is supposed to be kind of like taking us back to Godzilla's roots, um, and so it just looks really interesting, and I thought it was the director in an interview talked about how Godzilla is like a modern-day Tatarigami, hmm. which is, I guess, kind of like a Shinto deity. Um, the Tatarigami are gods that typically represent disasters, so like famine and disease, and that's actually where Kyoto's Gion Matsuri comes from, and it was originally a festival to kind of appease those gods because Kyoto had this like string of disease that was kind of ruining the city. And so they started the Gion Matsuri to appease the Tatarigami. Hmm. So yeah, I just think he's really interesting. And the director talks about he's half god and half monster. And you can't destroy him, but you can appease him. Oh. You can <laughs> so, only be appeased but never destroyed. Yeah, so I mean I have like a childhood fascination with Godzilla like I thought dinosaurs were really cool and then all of a sudden there was this like crazy dinosaur that was like you know fighting like other monsters and doing all this cool stuff and so I can remember watching like black and white Godzilla movies mm. um like on VHS and stuff so yeah oh, well you've convinced me I'll go see it with you okay if it's still in theaters <laughs> when you're back we'll go okay so did you know that you can still visit the very first school in Japan, the first organized school. I did know because you told me. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I <laughs> did you know, you, listener? <laughs> I knew you so, went on this uh, trip and yeah. you were like, I'm going to go see the first school in Japan. Yeah, so when I was in Tochigi Prefecture, we got to see the Ashikaga Gakko, and it's in the city town of Ashikaga. And it's a debated like when the school was officially opened as a organized school but from about the mid 1400s some things say like much earlier but it was founded by the samurai lord ashikaga yoshikane and it's it's you know promoted as being the place where japanese school education began but it sounds like from all the That's descriptions it's very different than what school is today when you and I think of school. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, usually, you know, people talk about what is it like Oxford and stuff about kind of pioneering the modern university system and talking about like what that looks like. So yeah, it's interesting to, so in this like school, I mean, think of all the things you teach or all the things that your students learn in the high school where you are. I doubt that they're studying Confucianism, Chinese medicine and strategics, but that's what, no, but I guess that's kind of the school. that's kind of like along the lines of what I would have guessed. Yeah. Like if you were going to ask me like what what did people study in Japan in the 1400s? Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing this is like a school similarly like probably for like adults. Like were they sending well, children there? No, they're sending they... children 
I mean, Hmm. I don't know how young these children are. I think young adults also, but um, the school's teachers were mostly Buddhist monks, but it was unusual because they didn't actually teach Buddhist studies in the curriculum because all, like a lot of other academic institutions during that time did teach Buddhist, uh, teach Buddhism actually in the curriculum, but this one, they believed that you should learn that in temples and not in schools. Hmm. Um, but it was free of charge. Like you could just go without paying any tuition, but all the pupils became monks when they entered the school. And I don't know. That's very different. How did they select the students? That's a good question. Because you say free of charge, but I guess in my head, I'm imagining like most other societies around the world, education was kind of like barred by like pedigree. It probably... So I'm kind of imagining that these are probably sons of samurais or lords. and Probably. I'm also just guessing, but it was probably people who were like from families that were wealthy enough that you could afford to not... (laughs) know that you could afford to not work during the day, like to not work in the fields. Like if you have free time, you could go to school. But I'm just guessing that... But hmm. yeah, the present building that you can actually go into is, of course, well, not, maybe not of course, but it is a reconstruction um, of what it looked like. Probably because Godzilla burned it down. Yeah. <laughs> well, not not far off. It's a construction of the school of what it looked like in the Edo period, but it was struck by lightning and destroyed by fire. So Godzilla. that's why they had to recreate it. It's a cover up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's nationally, it was recognized as a heritage site in... 2015 hmm. that's very interesting yeah and we'll talk more about heritage sites later wow spoiler alert yeah so the next fascinating article <laughs> i have post school is they need to do more school and more studying because if you remember maybe two or three episodes ago we mentioned a mystery tsunami mm. so there was a tsunami that had hit the coast the east coast of japan um and they don't know what caused it and flash forward to today, they still don't know <laughs> what caused it. Um, but there's a bit of an update, and it's even more mysterious. So the mystery tsunami that arrived in Japan in early October was actually one of 13. 13 mystery tsunamis? Yeah. So there was a 90-minute window where there was some kind of event. And in this 90-minute window, maybe Godzilla spawned 13 tsunamis. And apparently the way they overlap, I didn't know this, but if tsunamis catch each other, they, like, double. Oh. They can become, like, a bigger... <laughs> I thought they would kind of, like, cancel each other out, you know? I think maybe if they're heading towards each other, but if they're going the same direction and one's moving faster, they can end up, like, overlapping, and then the swell, oh. I guess, increases. Um, yeah, so it's pretty fascinating. So they still don't know what caused it, and they've been studying kind of this, like... N- mesh net of uh like drones that i guess are in the bottom of the ocean that measure like size i don't know yeah like size stuff seismic (laughs) activity Um, yeah so they're trying to figure out what happened but they said that there weren't any like earthquakes or anything um they did find some pumice stones floating on the surface of the water so they think it could have been volcanic activity but they haven't confirmed that And also, it could have just been volcanic activity from a volcano near, formerly known as Iwo Jima, now known as Iwamoto. But there's a new island, and it's in the Agasawara, I guess, island chain. Um, And you can watch videos of it and see pictures of it. It's fascinating. That's the most Um, interesting part of your update, not update, is that there's a whole new island. You don't like the mystery tsunamis? (laughs) It's so much mystery. It's so scary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a new island because right next to Iwamoto, you can like see it and it's forming right now. Um, and sand and pumice and all kinds of stuff has been coming up from underneath the ocean and forming a new landmass. Wow. And so people can hang out that well, not normal people. Probably can't hang out. It's really far away. It's really far away. The and Ogosawara currently... Ogosawara Islands, I didn't know this, but I was talking to somebody who's visited them. You have to take a 24 hour ferry. To they're get super far. Out there. Yeah. They're like technically part of Tokyo, but only because yeah, they're that's in like, like the like yeah, the prefecture the or closest whatever. thing. Yeah. So it's interesting because yeah, no one lives down there. Um, but there's a ground self-defense force whatever base on Iwamoto 
so they've been surveying it and kind of keeping an eye out. And I guess they're the ones that have been capturing the videos. And maybe I'm sure scientists can go down there, but mm. normal people can't really go to Iwamoto anymore. So you're saying Iwamoto, but it's just Iwoto. Oh, the news article I was reading was calling it Iwamoto. Oh, well, so when I was looking at your notes and I saw that formerly Iwo Jima, I was like, formerly? I've only ever heard it as Iwo Jima. So then I, that's my news thing is that I'm, if you're like me and you didn't know that in 2007, Iwo Jima was changed to Iwoto. Um, yeah, apparently it was Iwoto first. And that's hmm. because actually the kanji hasn't changed, but Shima is island. And when you put, you know, if depending on the character preceding that character, the pronunciation can change. So Shima changes to Jima. So Iwo Jima is Sulphur Island. And so they it was erroneously pronounced as Iwo Jima when it was Iwo To. Like To is the other way you can pronounce that kanji. But it's Who made this error originally? Apparently it was like some naval officers that arrived hmm. during like World War Two, like around the And they didn't ask the locals, hey, what do you call this place? They just like read a sign. I, and they were like, It's Iwo Jima. <laughs> I don't know. Just of course, you know, it's the site of the famous and pretty brutal battle um between the US and Japan in World War Two. And so yeah. then it became famous. Which, so then it just continued to be called Iwo Jima in the mm, media and in newspaper. Well, that's also media. Yeah. Probably very uh I don't know if it's like last samurai esque. Um, but there's a really good Clint Eastwood movie called Letters from Iwo Jima. Oh. And it's about the Battle of Iwo Jima. And I just went and looked, and we can post a link to this article. I actually, I must have mistyped it. The article does call it Iwoto. Um, Iwoto. Um, but there's a really cool, the article has a really cool video of this island getting mm. formed, which is yeah, pretty Of sweet. the new island, like below mm -hmm. Iwoto. Yeah, like that's you can cool. see them from each other. But yeah, that's pretty fascinating. That, And that's one of the ones, there are a bunch of islands like this where the locals kind of got kicked off and then they're not allowed to go back to see their, I don't know, you know, like childhood homes or mm -hmm. kind of like where their ancestors are from, which is pretty sad. Um, yeah, they got displaced by the self-defense force yeah, after World I, War II. And I guess current Iwato would be maybe not a great place to be anyway. It would be because really isolated. It would be difficult, but also the whole fact that it's rising a meter per year, um, which is about three feet. That's huge. Yeah, so every year it's been getting three feet <laughs> I feel like it's the only island that that's happening to. Everywhere else people are like, oh, because of global warming, like this will just disappear in a certain well, amount of years. It's because it's part of this volcanic chain. I also think maybe some Hawaiian islands are growing, hmm. um, but it's because of the volcanic chain that like the stuff from underground is still pushing upward. Hmm. So it's kind of terrifying that, yeah. what if it just blew up? I don't know how it works, <laughs> but oh, no. frightening. It's pretty um, cool though. Yeah. So pretty fascinating, fascinating place. But yes, unfortunately the locals can't really go back um, and see it. Hmm. But yeah, very interesting stuff going on down there. And uh, we'll link the video because it is really cool that, yeah, an island just popped up out of the ocean. Wow. So in other um, you know, fun fact news. You were telling me about, so we talked about heritage views yeah. or heritage sites earlier. And you so were talking about a one train. more controversial question for you. Okay. So uh, recently a monorail in Tokyo received night view heritage status, mm. um, which we, you know, you already mentioned it too, that that one school got heritage status in 2007 or was it 2005? Um, and it just seems like, so Japan, I've been told this, that Japanese people that travel are very obsessed with, and this is, of course, stereotype generalization, not always true, but many people are obsessed with um, top lists. So they're really into, like, the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and they're really into kind of, like, here are the, you know, top 100, like, sites. And so sometimes I wonder if they use these, like, labels as to kind of, like, generate this perceived idea of kind of 
something special that yeah. they're trying to get people to go see. I mean, everybody likes to be on the best of list, so. Yeah, but it's just kind of interesting because then at some point it does seem to start watering down your list. Yeah. When at some point it's like you're just, you can throw a rock and you hit a World <laughs> Heritage site. It's kind of yeah. like, come on. like. So is it the night view... Is it special because you can see a lot of stars or you can see some like, Oh, no, cool it's city like lights? in Tokyo. Oh. It's like a view of the city, I think, from the monorail. Oh. So the view at night is supposed to be beautiful, like from I'm within. sure it is, but that's They really did show a picture, and the picture is really beautiful. And admittedly, if I had time to kill and I was, I, and it was in Tokyo, I would go. I probably wouldn't go out of my way just to see it. Mm-hmm. But if I was in Tokyo and it was a night and I was like, oh, what can we do? I'd probably go give it a try because now I've read the article. Yeah. So the, it, they kind of got me. Yeah, it does generate tourism. I mean, I guess it just like tells you about cool things you might want to see. Yeah. It's just interesting though that then, and this isn't like a UNESCO thing. I yeah. think this is just a Japan. Just national. Like a national heritage thing. Mm -hmm. But at some point it does seem to kind of water down the idea of they're just if everything is special then nothing is special you know yeah i guess so i'm okay with there being like unesco world heritage being like top tier mm -hmm. and then just nationally <laughs> like putting a bunch of stuff out there that's like you might want to see this it's pretty yeah but yeah i understand but i mean it's like japan's like top 100 beaches yeah and like uchinata is like we're one of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, we're in it that's true but going along with like the, st the stamp collecting and kind of like just the collecting kind of uh, culture here that does kind of play in that favor. So, for example, you can get stamps of the top 100 castles. And then I was even at a temple. And they've like all been rebuilt. <laughs> yeah, like the there's 90s. only 12 originals left. Oh, yeah. But yeah, being um, harsh. It's still pretty cool. And then, but yeah. I was at a temple getting a goshuin, and I noticed that they had a stamp, and it had a 100 on it, as in, I guess, there's 100 top yeah, temples. Yeah, one of 100. And, but it does make you want to, like, go around and collect them. At least it makes me. I was like, oh, if I get this stamp, like, there's one on my journey to all 100. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are going to move right on past the toy poodle joining the police force, as well as the rats moving into Ginza. No. And jump straight to the word of the week. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll mention those next week or you can just do a quick Google if you're interested. Yeah. But my word of the week is shinbun oh. or shimbun, which is newspaper. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do you know what that is? But I already know yeah. you do. I read the newspaper a lot. The online version because it's in English. Yeah. And a lot of our kind of like random facts and stories, we were just talking about are from the asahi shimbun yeah and they have one of the best english translation websites that's really up to date and it's also not behind like a paywall mm. or anything like that like some of the other ones i think like tokyo times or something like that um well, so maybe it's only one of the pay. best not paid the other ones might be better we just yeah don't i don't know about them. the actual quality of their journalism well we don't pay for it no. so we can't really yeah talk. you can also use the nhk but they're not a newspaper well, so I said shimbun or shinbun because in my textbook, the romaji has an N, mm. but the asahi shimbun has an M in the romaji. I mean, if you just look at the kanji, I, I guess yeah. that's what you should be doing. But yeah, that's what that's what newspaper is. Yeah. And both are kind of accepted. It's hard to tell. Like even when I'm saying them, it's probably hard to tell the difference between shinbun and shimbun. Yeah. So... That's good. What's your word? So mine, and this could be an entire episode in the future on its own. Okay. So I'll try and keep it brief. Um, my word is washi. Washi as in paper? Nope. Remember I told you um, I was in a conversation with one of my coworkers, and in Japan there are a million different pronouns. So as a Japanese individual, you can kind of pick what you call yourself. Mm. So most people learn watashi. Um, which means I, so like watashi wa... Gender like, neutral one. Yeah, like watashi wa amerikaijin desu, like I am an American. Um, or you could say boku wa amerikaijin desu, because I'm a young male, so I could use boku. Um, but washi is supposedly a pronoun of choice of elderly men in Kanazawa. 
<laughs> and I was told that that's like a Kanazawa specific dialect thing. I haven't researched this, so I don't know if this is true. Maybe other regions in Japan use washi. But I was told it's yeah very specific to Kanazawa. The mm. el- elderly men, maybe 50 plus, will sometimes <laughs> use washi to and talk about themselves. When we were at dinner the other night and we were meeting some other people who lived in Kanazawa, and including Japanese guys, one of the... 60 plus year old Japanese men was like yeah I do use washi I think he was joking because I was like asking him because I was like I was like do you guys know about this and they're like yeah we've heard that and then the elderly guy was like washi wa he was like (laughs) I think he was kind of making fun of his own age Uh, I don't know if he actually (laughs) used it but I think he was just being funny we're like yeah we've heard that yeah Mm. so yeah it was very interesting yeah we should do a whole one on just like the pronouns you can choose it's crazy yeah there are a lot But that brings us to the end this week, trying to keep it somewhat brief. So next time, hopefully we'll see you here next week. Yeah. So thanks for listening. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.